Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Aerial Property Advisors, Sterling National Bank, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, B6 Real Estate Advisors, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Properties LLC Handler Real Estate, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marengo Family Foundation, and these friends. So he always realized that he wanted to be in retail when he started walking in the streets of Jersey City and seeing an Izod sweater. But the man has been in retail his entire career, starting really at Gromax Stationery, then Lord & Taylor, then Saks Fifth Avenue, Bombwood Teller, The Limited, Ann Taylor, Brooks Brothers, Warnico and more important, a philanthropist and member of the Board of Public Companies. I have Joe Gromek here. Thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here with you. So tell me the story of on your mother's side and then on your father's side, how they arrived in America and how they ended up in Jersey City. Well, my uh, mother's uh, father and mother uh, arrived right before the turn of the century. Uh, Where did they come from? Uh, Poland. 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 And uh, I think they probably met on the, on the boat coming over married soon as they got here and uh, landed in Ellis Island and uh, took, up, uh, took up residence in Jersey City at that point. We have a picture of your grandmother. Her husband died? Right after my mother was born. Uh, my mother was the uh, fourth of the line of girls, uh, so she was the youngest girl and uh, my grandfather died right after she was born. Okay, so now tell me about dad's side. Uh, similar story, grandmother and grandfather from Poland around the same time and um, arrived through Ellis Island in Jersey City. Both families managed to, uh, to work hard and uh, to what work What did long. the grandparents do? Uh, they were a, a combination of uh, between uh, railroads and, and laboring kinds of work. And my grandmother uh, worked cleaning offices on Wall Street. So tell me about dad, because your 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 dad's an interesting character. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, my father was a child of the Depression, so uh, quickly, so he he understood that he had to uh, raise money for the family. So he started selling newspapers right out of high school, and uh, then as the war came on, uh, he went into the uh, to the army. As soon as he finished there, he came out in around 45, he went into business quickly. So he saved some money through the army and uh, managed to, to start a, a retail. At that time, before the Dwayne Reeds and the Walgreens, it was United... Uh, United Whale and Drugs. Whale and drugs. And Rexall was the, the big name. We have a photo, possibly what the Gromax store looked like in Jersey City. I saw that photo. I think it's very similar. And actually... Uh, the Whalen folks would come over monthly and, and dress the windows. So it's a, a good concept. So my father bought from another family. He bought the store and it became a family business. He worked there with my mom 
uh, with his brothers and sisters, and uh, you know, and it became a family family now, family initiative. Now you said to me when we got together. Was it your dad or was it his brothers and sisters who tried to open up like a WT Grant or a, well, they, a, a they Woolworth did, type of store? They did it collectively. So my father with one of his other brothers, uh, my uncle Ed, who also had a store similar to my father's after, after a time, and uh, one of my aunts and her husband, uh, they collectively put this building together. They built it. So from scratch, and it was pretty large. You know, I'm just thinking about how big is it, and I would say it's probably about, you know, between 10 and 15,000 square feet. So good size, uh, good. But size that wasn't Gromax Stationery. No, that was no, no. It was an independent operation, and it was like a Woolworth or a W.S. Grant. Right. My father, uh, after it opened, he was uh, involved with the business for three months, and um, he was the oldest in the family, and he was accustomed to being the guy in charge. And I don't think he enjoyed having other people uh, with uh, responsibilities that crossed his lines. He was bought out very quickly. We have this great picture of your dad in front of Monmouth Racetrack. He was a fashionista also, right? Yeah, I, you know, I saw that picture, I think, for the first time going through the archives recently. And I'm looking at him with the uh, French cuffs, the belt, the pleat on the trouser, the shoes, the hat, the fedora. He always wore a fedora. So I think I probably got a little bit of style from my father. So when I was starting the show, I was talking about you were walking on the street and you had the fashion in you. What was that? Well, there are a couple of stories. Um, one, on TV, I once saw uh, tennis players wearing what must have been an, uh, a Lacoste shirt, and I saw that alligator. And I wanted with that shirt, and I was probably seven years old. Trying to find that shirt for a seven-year-old was near impossible. Uh, my family searched all around. They came up with many different animals, but not the alligator. Yeah, the little alligator. And, and uh, somewhere along the way, we, I think we, uh, we, we located it somehow, somewhere, and it arrived. So that was one. The second one is that um, as a kid walking to school in the morning, uh, I walked by every morning a shop called the Cinderella Shop. And uh, they had beautiful clothes for, for kids. And my mom uh, would take me in occasionally. You know, we, were, we weren't wealthy, but we, had, we could afford to do some things like that. And she would take me in and um, I'd say, I really like that. And, you know, she would get it for me. So every couple of months we would do that. And um, after a while, we went in and the sales clerk said to my mom, she said, Mrs. Gromack, your son really knows what he wants. You don't have to accompany him if you don't want to. We could just charge it to you. My mother freaked out. She said, that'll never happen. And, you know, we've, we moved on from there. You went to parochial? Did. Our Lady of Sorrows uh, Grammar School in Jersey right. City. We have a picture of your graduation and your diploma. Okay. And then you went to? I went to Stevens Academy in Hoboken, New Jersey, an independent school and uh, one, of the, one of the best in the, in the state at that point. So how did you decide to go to St. Peter's University, at that time St. Peter's College, right. before it became a university? Well, I was looking at uh, going away to school and uh, had been accepted to a few places and uh, was trying to make up my mind what to do. And my father said to me, if you want to, um, if you want to stay home, um, and if you want to go to St. Peter's locally, um, first of all, I'll buy you a new car, a Mustang, and secondly, uh, you work in the business. And I thought about it, and I said, okay, let me try this. Now, besides the stationery, your father went into the, the machine, the vending machine well, business, he was, right? He, my father was, uh, he was an entrepreneur. He did several different things. Grumex Stationery became a wholesale operation after a while. So he was providing um, the municipalities in New Jersey with all different kinds of stationery. So everything from uh, ribbons for typewriters at the time, uh, pens, papers, typing paper. And he did it through, through much of Jersey City, through all of the different agencies. So I would be involved with that process. It was uh, everything from working with him on, on, on the biddings, creating the prices that we would, would um, you know, present a bid for to actually delivering the product to, to the locations. So when you're in college, it was the time for the draft. Right. Initially, you got a job as a public school teacher. I was a low number on the draft. Uh, so um, I was thinking about going away to business school. At that point in time, I had enough of my father's business, and uh, I was uh, prepared to get an MBA. Uh, when my spoke to my draft board, they said, you, you'll be drafted in September. A friend of mine called me and said, I just uh, was offered a position as a school teacher in Jersey City. Uh, 
and I get a deferment for that. So I immediately followed suit, drafted off of him, and uh, I was hired very quickly. The school had already been in session for three days, and I became a fifth grade teacher in Jersey City. How did you get the job at Lord & Taylor? Um, after, after teaching for a period of time, got into the Army Reserves, and then um, I looked at getting into the fields that I was interested in. So uh, I was sent by an employment agency to Lord & Taylor. And it was like back to my roots, here I am. And it was the perfect timing. I interviewed at three different companies. Uh, one of them was American Express, one was Lord & Taylor, and one was a paper company, West Vaco. And um, the, uh, the Lord & Taylor thing seemed perfect for me, and I was accepted immediately into the training program. So you were in the training program, and then you go away to Fort Sam Houston, and then you come back and you go to Bellison? Bella Kinwood. Bella well, first I was, I was in the Fifth Avenue store, uh, for a period of time, and then I was promoted to assistant managing director of the uh, Philadelphia Lord & Taylor store, which is on Mainline Avenue in Balakinwood. And you spent a couple of years at Two Lord years there, and came back to manage the Fifth Avenue store for Lord & Taylor. And then what's in the next stop? Another Fifth Avenue chain, right? Well, there was a ma major management uh, shakeup at, at Lord & Taylor. All my heroes, after seven years, uh, departed very quickly, and a new management team came in. So, uh, And the new CEO, who uh, just arrived from San Francisco uh, to bond with Taylor, was someone who worked formerly at Lord & Taylor, who I knew. And they approached me and offered me the position to be the general manager of Bonwit Teller on Fifth Avenue. At a very young age. I think you were 29? About that, yeah. So Bonwit Teller, before Mr. Trump bought the property, okay, uh, is a f leading department store. High fashion, carriage trade store, you know, with, a good, with a very good reputation. Uh, I was there for nine months, and uh, uh, it was one of those situations where I couldn't do anything correctly. So after, after nine months, realized that this was not the place for me. So you found another Fifth Avenue retailer. I, I was fortunate enough to be recommended to the folks over at Saks and uh, interviewed uh, at Saks Fifth Avenue. And I was um, uh, appointed to be a, a, a buyer of better women's sportswear. Let's talk about your career at Saks. Well, I joined Saks as... You know, the, the, the area is called Bridge Sportswear. It was bridging the designer on one side and moderate sportswear on the other side, and it was a new evolving area. So uh, Saks created this, and it was probably the first one in the country. Uh, I was given the, the task of, of coming up with the resources that we would, we would purchase from and get the business off the ground. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was probably one of the most fun jobs I've ever had in retail. And uh, I did that for, for close to two years and then was app appointed to, to be a merchandise manager. In which department? Junior, junior sportswear. Now, I had bought junior sportswear briefly at, uh, at Lord & Taylor. Lord & Taylor. So I had the relationships there, and it was kind of, uh, it, was, it was good going back to what I had known very well. Uh, quickly, at, after, after my junior merchandise manager spot, I took over uh, women's sportswear, uh, and then uh, all the vice president, and then became uh, the uh, associate general merchandise manager over the Saks catalog. It was called right, Folio. Folio. Right, which, which was great because it gave me a, a different area of the business. I had been in management, uh, running stores. I'd been in merchandising, running product, management over, over product. And now, you're now I'm catalog. running direct. Right. So this was, this was great. Now, do you think I wanted that job? No. When they offered it to me, I said, why do I want to do this? But in retrospect, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me career-wise. It, it allowed me then to understand, moving forward, what e-commerce might ultimately Right, so you into. were really at the this onset of e-commerce from the catalog business. Well, this I was mean, direct. So, you know, I, right. I think, you know, down the road when we get to it, I'll tell you how we morphed into that at Brooks Brothers. Very okay, quickly. but we, we, we're not there yet. I okay? understand. So then Invesco takes Invesco over. Corp. Right. They, ownership of Saks. Right, and uh, management changes, and it was lucrative for me to leave at that point in time. So how did you make the decision to leave the New York area to go to, to the home of Ohio State? Yeah. Les so Leslie Wexner in the country. Right. So there were, you know, at, at that point in time, I, I left uh, Saks in November of 89 uh, and um, quickly looked at five different situations. And... Um, 
for some reason, some were better than others, some looked more interesting. I made three trips to Columbus to meet with, uh, with the folks at, at uh, the Limited and Les Wexner each time, and ultimately decided that, uh, that I could learn the most by taking that, that opportunity. So when you went to the Limited, which is 30 years ago, the Limited was growing, okay? Leslie had started the company from scratch with a loan from his mother, I remember. And, but it wasn't as, as huge as it was. Well, it was still a growing company. Uh, the Limited Stores division that I was in, I think we had 800 stores and uh, um, it was a billion dollar brand and it was still on, on the growth trajectory. And your, and your role at the Limited at that I time? went in as the head of women's ready to wear. So it was over, uh, over things like coats, suits, uh, dresses, jackets, blazers. And it was a time when, um, when women were wearing cashmere blazers. And since some of my background was involved in, in that kind you of were merchandising. merchandising. So, um, so it came second nature to me. I had been a coat buyer, I had been a sportswear buyer, so overseeing that area was, was, was really you know, quite a, you know, right in my sweet spot. But you were, you were in a different world. I mean, you Very were in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, <clears throat> I, um, you know, I had an apartment in New York uh, at uh, 1060 uh, Park Avenue. I lived, uh, I had a home in East Hampton. Uh, I was single at the time, divorced from my first wife, and um, went down to Columbus, and they were showing me land that I should buy and move into uh, New Albany, where all of the, uh, all the limited executives were. And ultimately, they took me around to a restaurant for lunch in the German village, and there was a wonderful street uh, called, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, uh, something Park Avenue. And we came driving down the street and I said, this is great. It was cobblestone streets, gas lights, all renovated, turn of the century homes. And uh, they showed me a couple of houses and, and I saw one that was for rent. I said, show me that one, please. And I looked at it and I said, that's great. Three stories, just totally renovated, uh, has a driveway, a perfect house for me. And I asked, how much was it? And they said it was uh, $600 a month. I paid them for a year right there and they said, this is great, that'll work. So you spent what, about three years at the Limited? Just about, yeah. And then, then how, what was it, Ann Taylor? Correct. So uh, I was doing reasonably well at, at the Limited. I, I learned uh, so much. It was, for me, it was the best move that I could have made within my career. I could have never done the things that, that I did afterwards if I had not done those three years in Columbus. Uh, Wexner's a phenomenal leader. He's a smart man and he thinks differently. And I always thought one way and now I could think much more broadly after that experience. Uh, Ann Taylor came to me to be the number two, the, uh, the general merchandise manager over the company. And, um, and at, at that time, what did Ann Taylor own? They had their Ann Taylor just, stores? It was only Ann Taylor at that point in time. And uh, I think I was there for a few months and we, we started Loft, which was the second division. Ann Taylor was on a roll, uh, had gotten on a roll, and uh, we did very well. Stock you know, went straight up and uh, things were looking really promising for, for Ann Taylor. Um, I was uh, considered to be the president in the future. So I had a, a good career path there. Uh, but then uh, Brooks Brothers knocked on my door, Marks and Spencer. They were looking for a CEO of uh, Brooks Brothers. And what year is that? That would have been uh, 95. Right, now Marks and Spencer had come to America. They Seven bought, years earlier. Right, they, they bought King's Supermarkets. King's in New Jersey. And, and they bought Brooks Brothers. Right. And they, they struggled with, uh, with Brooks Brothers for seven years. And uh, I think the retail stores, when they started, uh, there were 40 plus stores, and they were doing around 270 million. And I think when I joined, those, those stores were down to 175 million. So a steep decline in, in, right. and, in existing Right, and then they also base. had the outlet stores. But they were opening stores, so the, the revenue was growing, but the existing franchise was really suffering. So you go to Brooks Brothers as the president, right? President and CEO, yes. So yeah. let's talk about the Brooks Brothers before 2001 and changes. Uh, well, I, I was radical. So I came in and this place needed to be shaken up. Uh, Marks and Spencer wasn't happy and uh, I believe that to do this, it had to you know, move into the to, to 20th century, and it wasn't. 
So, uh, you know, the, the, the green walls we painted white, changed things around, started merchandising in a very different way, uh, putting fashion in the front of the store. So uh, no, no white shirts on the tables in front, if there was a table. Colors, stripes, patterns. Stripes, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some of it was very well received. It, commercially, it did well, but there were a lot of customers that didn't like it. Uh, and it took some convincing uh, to get them to understand that this was to, the intent was to bring in a new customer. The existing customer wasn't enough to support the business going right. forward. And it's 2001 before 9-11 and Brooks Brothers and you, they, they're thinking of Marks selling Spence, the company, selling the company. Right. and you were thinking of raising some money in private equity or? Yeah, so the private equity folks were very interested in, uh, in acquiring Brooks Brothers with me running it. And so I worked with them and, uh, and with some uh, strategic buyers as well. And then 9-11 happened. And suddenly the credit markets dried up. Um, the understanding was that retail was going to suffer dramatically, so valuations crashed. And uh, you know, so the, the process continued, but the price of the business went way down and um, you needed deep pockets in order to afford it. So uh, Claudio De Vecchio came in and made a good offer, and uh, the best offer, and he took the day. Then you started spending more time with your five-year-old son, right? Well, I had a, you know, I was basically going to take a year off, so um, in between looking for my next gig, if you will, uh, my wife was a very successful retailer. Uh, Gail was executive vice president of Saks Fifth Avenue in charge of all the women's better designer products. She was traveling quite a bit. She'd be in Europe several times a year and, uh, and traveling around the country. So uh, I was a stay-at-home dad for a while you know, with our son who was five, six years old at so the time. How did uh, Alvarez and Marcel uh, find you to take over the bankrupt Warnico? Uh, Search firms had had the position. Uh, I was put in the into the into the game, if you will. And um, after going through the process, they came up with several candidates. Uh, ultimately, I carried the day. Uh, there are creditors who had a lot to do with that. Uh, so five big banks own the company. They really wanted to see a major cultural change in the way the business was going to be managed and uh, and in governance. Uh, I think part of my background. Uh, and going back even to St. Peter's, a Jesuit college, uh, had a lot to do with that. And they, they felt that, that uh, comfortable that, that from a governance standpoint that I could do things to the business that maybe other people couldn't do. Right, and people didn't realize, but Warnico had the Calvin Klein brand. Warnico owned the, uh, owned the uh, Calvin Klein underwear brand and uh, licensed uh, the Calvin Klein jeans brand at the time in North America, basically. And uh, we were able to sell uh, Calvin Klein underwear globally uh, in jeans in North America. Over time, uh, after I had the position, I was able to acquire the rights to Calvin Klein jeans globally, which was a big deal. So we bought that from an Italian who was operating the, that part of the business in Europe and Asia. Suddenly we had Calvin Klein underwear in jeans as the foundation for the Warnico business. You spend how many years at Warnico? I started there in 2003 and left in 2012, so nine years. I was 66 years old at the time. I thought I would, I would check out at 65, but the stock market effects of, uh, of 2008, 2009 uh, had a dramatic impact on, on uh, uh, my net wealth, basically. All of my wealth was in Warnico stock. I, I, I was granted a lot of equity when I began with the company, held on to it, and I was given equity uh, every year. So I, I was not selling any of it, and I thought it was, it was going to be worth a lot of money someday. And ultimately, uh, 2009, it went down by about 90%. So my plan to retire went on, on the sideboard for a while, and then um, we bounced back, and suddenly, uh, uh, by 2010, 11, 12, we were back in the game again. Let's talk a little bit about Gail and your son. Well, Gail and I were married in Bale in uh, the year after I became CEO of Brooks Brothers, 96. Uh, we adopted Bray in, uh, from Guatemala in, uh, two years later. In he was born in 1998. We're a family, so it was great. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the new school charities and your current involvements. Well, when I decided to retire, I was running a global company. Uh, we had a dozen brands, you know, different operations around the world. I was running 24-7. For me to retire 
meant that I had to do a lot of things. So it was important for me to set up my retirement, which was really act two, if you will. So I set myself up to be on a number of public company boards. Uh, when I left Warnico, I was on my own board and two others. Um, typically you're allowed one. They knew I was retiring, so the board allowed me to take a second, uh, a second uh, directorship. Uh, and immediately after that, joined two more boards. So one is chairman of the Toomey Company, uh, which we ultimately sold for, to Samsonite. We sold to Samsonite three or four years later, uh, and and Guest Jeans as well, and uh, Wolverine Worldwide, which I had been on in, in the children's place, and then some private equity positions. I was on a couple of boards where I invested in, and uh, and then on the charity side, um, in philanthropy, that was important to me to be able, you know, as. Uh, our equity built and I started to divest after St. leaving. St. Peter's University, St. Ronald Peter's, McDonald. Uh, I was on the Parsons, uh, uh, Parsons Board of Governors where I actually chaired the Board of Parsons at the time. Uh, Ronald McDonald House, which I had been involved with for a long time. Involved with, with different hospitals, your friend um, Herb Lepore hooks me into, into his relationships right. with the urology group. Uh, so all total I was on 13 different boards uh, a year after I, I stepped down from Act One. So it was really a good idea that your mother took you to the retail store and the alligator because the alligator had an effect on your entire career. And I'd like to thank you for being here. This went by fast. Thank you so much. Appreciate My it. My pleasure.